So welcome everybody back to uh, episode nine of Cyprus Asking People Things. And it's been a very uh, interesting couple of weeks with what's going on in the world. But hey, um, this went from episode one to all the way to episode nine. And I'm just really happy to have everybody who's been on here so far. Um, today, we have the amazing Andrew Warboys, and I have been working with this uh, fellow musician for the past almost two years now. It has been such an incredible journey learning uh, not only music production, but musical direction and how you can really get the most out of not only yourself, but the team you work with. But uh, today we are really going to be looking at how one can really get into a creative state of flow um, and tools and tricks you can use to get yourself into that state of flow without uh, resorting to, um, you know, oh no, what, what do I do? Um, I can't get into my state of flow. Well, we're going to talk about some of the tricks that we can get into. Anyway, Andrew, if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about yourself and what you've done so far and uh, what you're uh, going to get up to. That's a lot of information to get out. Uh, yeah, my name's Andrew Warboys. I've been working as a professional musician since I was probably about 15 years old and for the last 10 years or so I've been working professionally as a musical director uh, in the field of musical theatre. And so you say that but you have done so much. Like uh, you have been nominated recently, congratulations as well, nominated for uh, musical direction, uh, best musical direction of musicals were within, uh, is it just Sydney or New South Wales? Yes, yeah, the Sydney Theatre Award. So it was for Young Frankenstein at the Hayes and Merrily We Roll Along at the Hayes. Wow, like that is, um, I just think it's so incredible because I've been in a several, <laughs> literally several musicals now and just seeing the difference of how, things are done musically, it's actually incredible to see how you have shaped um, the direction, the musical direction and co-collaborating with the director as well. Um, so you've been nominated for those awards, but you were nominated for a Helpman. Oh, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. That was at the right at the beginning of the Hayes. They produced Sweet Charity and I was nominated for a Helpman Award back then. Why did you actually get nominated for that? Because how does, how does that process happen? Do you well, know? it's interesting in the Helpman Awards because all of the awards are sort of lumped into one category. So, you know, the musical direction for ballet, for opera, for musicals are all lumped into the one uh, category. So if I remember correctly, I was up against Wagner. Uh, <laughs> it was the ring cycle. So I thought that was kind of nice to be nominated alongside... Uh, such great, um, strangely enough, I can't remember who that other musical director was, but it was Wagner, so. That's absolutely incredible because uh, it's ever since then you've gone on this musical journey for the past decade, um, directing a myriad of musicals. Yeah. Um, uh, the most, well, the first one I saw of yours was actually American Psycho, also at the Hayes Theatre. Uh, the Hayes Theatre gets a lot of shout outs on this podcast. Yeah. But it was American, Funny that. <laughs> American Psycho and I loved it. And I didn't even know you were the musical director there. So when I first met you, I sort of had a, uh, I, was, I was fanning out a little bit. Uh, but uh, can you explain a little bit about your process on how you approached that? Because it's actually really quite interesting in my opinion. Well, I mean, what it comes down to, and it's something that we were just talking about before, just off camera, so to speak, is that the parameters that you're given to work within, um, especially in independent theatre, are fairly well locked in. And I mean, obviously, that's got a lot to do with budget, that there's only so much money that you can spend on musicians. Um, in the instance of American Psycho... Uh, it was a little bit of an unknown because Alex Balage, who was the director of that production, um, was kind of given poetic licence to do what he wanted with the show because the show uh, has only had two outings, once on Broadway and once in the West End, and it didn't do very well at all. Um, and so we had to kind of work out how to reinvent the wheel a little bit. Um, and so our restraints are the black box theatre of the Hayes um, and straight away they knew there wasn't going to be budget for a band because they wanted this whopping great big revolving stage um, and so that sort of, you know, negated the use of a lot of live musicians. So the show has been done with backtracks 
before and they sent us all of the backtracks and I had a good listen to them and they sounded quite dated and I was like, well, it's little wonder that the show didn't fly with these backtracks, even though uh, uh, on Broadway they had backtracks and a live drum and what have you. It just was a little dated. So I was really bold and they sent me all the stems and for those that don't know, the stems are all the individual instruments recorded, like just the drum track, just the bass track, just the guitar track. They gave me all of these bits and pieces that are supposed to be shaped together in a program and you play all of these stems side by side. So I took the ones that I liked like there might have been a guitar in one particular track that I liked uh, and then I sort of subverted it and thought, okay, that's an acoustic guitar, it's a little too pretty, I'm going to put a heap of distortion on it, I'm going to put my own drums in there, my own bass and before we knew it, by the time we got to the rehearsals, I had completely reimagined and redone all of the tracks, obviously with Alex, he'd sort of been with me every step of the way and there were sounds that he liked. We were just bold and we did it. Yes. We went along and we did it because, you know, it's a bit of our, a bit of an edict that we have at the Hayes that you go along and you do something until you're told not to. Mm. And, I mean, that's got a lot to do with the fact that we're not doing carbon copy shows. Yes. We're not doing shows that require us to uh, uh, recreate what happened on Broadway. Exactly. We have... Uh, poetic license at the Hayes. So by the time we got to the rehearsals of American Psycho, I'd redone all the arrangements and Bradley, the producer, said to me one day, um, we'd better make sure we've got permission to do this. And I was like, oh, <laughs> God, we don't even really have permission to use these tracks. So Bradley said, okay, look, I need to send them two tracks. What do you suggest? And I gave him two tracks to send. And within a week we had word back from the licensing, go ahead, we love it, do it. Um, and, and so we did. So that's how American Psycho came along. And they, they were the parameters we had to work within and you get creative. Exactly. And it was very fortunate that that happened because it um, was very well received, very, very well received, yep. and then went on to do a season at the Opera House yep. and that was actually meant to go on a tour. Unfortunately, yep. that has been postponed. Yes, because COVID. Because of, because of the big C. BC, um, BC, because COVID. Because of COVID season two. <laughs> Let's wait and see what happens with season three. Um, We're in it. We're living season three right now. (laughs) Yeah, the pilot episode was New Year's Eve. (laughs) Um, So we're going to talk about how we actually get into that creative flow uh, because, as you've already alluded to, uh, it's about giving yourself those parameters. So when you're actually collaborating with other people, you're not only thinking outside the box but thinking inside of the box and you've already alluded to that being budgetary restraints, Um, you can't have a 12-peak orchestra, you need to only have three people do the equivalent of. Um, How can we do this uh, in a small space with only 100 seats instead of a 2,000-seat theatre? How do you then go about collaborating with the likes of uh, Alex Balage and then getting that show, whittling it down to what it actually needs to be? So what was the actual process when you were in the room with Alex? Well, in actual fact, let's go back a little bit further to the beginning of The Haze with Mm -hmm. Dean Bryant Um, because as a musical director, you have to listen to what the director has envisaged first because in my mind the director is the boss. The director has the vision and with Dean quite often months and months ahead he knows what he wants the music to do. He knows what he wants the musical director to do with the music. So you may sort of think, oh, well, so as a musical director you don't get a lot of freedom. Uh, On the contrary, with Sweet Charity, we moved into the haze. There was hardly any infrastructure. There There were two speakers above where the audience bank was and that's all we had to work with. We had no idea what we were going to do with that show. Traditionally, Sweet Charity is, you know, anywhere to 17 to 25 musicians. It's a big band, big Broadway sound, you know, trumpets, trombones, a, uh, uh, a sax section, the whole thing. Yes. But in the haze, we had this little box out the back and Dean said, you need to fit the band in there. <laughs> uh, he also gave me a role to play. So he said, okay, the piano can come out a bit, but you have to fit your musicians in that box. And right back then, 
uh, we were doing co-ops. We didn't know what the haze was back then. Mm. There was a little bit of money so that everybody would get a piece of the piece of the pie at the end of the run. We all understood that when we went into it. So I thought, okay, what can I do? So I ended up with a five-piece band. I thought as long as I've got drums, bass, guitar, keyboard, uh, and I had a second keyboard player who also played saxophones and uh, various other woodwind instruments, we actually had to take in our own PA system in order to amplify the band because there just wasn't anything there. So we had our own PA system at the back of the room behind the band, um, you know, behind Joe Acaria. He had a speaker so he could actually hear <laughs> what the band was playing. We didn't, you know, there was no headphones. We weren't using any kind of Aviom system, you know, yes. to monitor. So the parameters were quite strict but in the end it worked in our favour. Mm. Because what happened was all of the microphones, the, the the singers went through the front of house system and the band was always behind. So the clarity was great. Yeah. So when we previewed that show, and also you've got to remember that the Hayes is only 110 seats, everybody's very close to the action. Yes. And in Sweet Charity you had performers who are at the peak of their of their careers. Yes. And so if you're sitting in the front row at the Hayes, you are seeing these people who are so good and they are right there. Mm. They are right there. Um, the experience is visceral. So the parameters pushed us into a... pushed us creatively into a place where we created something unique. Yes, absolutely. So that's kind of... that, And that's with Dean. Um, but collaborating with other directors, other directors... For example, Sean Rennie with Rent is so open right at the beginning to anything that the music team wants to throw at him. And he very much wants to try things on the floor, meaning in the rehearsal room, let's try this. Like in, in Rent there's a scene uh, that is different in every production that is traditionally on a backtrack. It's the only time when the band doesn't play. Yep. Um, we didn't know what we were going to do with that. So in the room I said, okay, let's let's bring in some of the band. You remember that day you brought in your uh, cajon yes. and Cluffy came in with yeah. his guitar yeah. and I thought let's put everybody in a circle and let's just throw spaghetti at the wall mm. and workshop. So that kind of collaboration straight away becomes very communal between the cast, between the band. The director kind of steps back, yeah, has a look at what's going on and it's like I want to use a bit of that. Yeah. I want to use a bit of that. Don't want to use any of that. Um, so that kind of collaboration is great. Um, with Alex, Alex is kind of the same but he likes to get everything up and running as quickly as possible so that when we get it into the theatre and on the stage he can start to mould it a little more. And mm. he uses his previews uh, so well. He'll get into the show and by the end of the first preview, okay, I want you to change that number. We want that to go faster. Cut those two bars there. Then mm. the next night we try that. Um, and so by the time we get to opening night, it's it's quite a different beast. So the collaboration, you have to be open-minded and you have to bend like the reed. Yep. You have to just listen. Yes. Um, you can't go in there with too many of your own ideas and think, no, this is the way it's going to be. Yes. Because you know, straight away you're negating part of the process. Yeah, and that uh, that really brings up uh, the importance of as a creative person, when we are going into the creative situations, we need to have been practised at our craft. Yep. So uh, for me personally, going into being, to be your drummer, um, I have a wide variety of tools at my disposal so when you ask something of me, I'm not precious about changing anything. Yep. Because if a song sounds a certain way on the track, but, you know, we don't have the same instrumentation about yep. that, what we're going to do, uh, th that drum part might not work because it's accenting, say, the horns. But when there are no horns, what am I accenting with? Absolutely nothing. So yep. it's going in with that clear mind and then with you to the directors, going in with that, okay, I know my craft and your craft being piano production orchestration. Yep. Um, you know your craft so well that you can immediately or almost immediately uh, bend to the, the need of what the production is needing. 
yep. as opposed to uh, going in and, and not knowing. And this is also saying like, because you, you are an a avid um, prepper. You know, you're always prepping for a show. Or if you don't have time to prep for a show, you will find ways to prep for that show. Yep. Or if there is literally no time to prep for a show, you will you will still have the skills at your disposal on the keys, uh, being able to improvise on the spot um, or be able to bend to the demand of the, uh, the collaborator or the musical director. Look, and that's also the beauty of the independent theatre. As I said before, you know, the carbon copy musical, the great big commercial musicals, mm. which are fantastic in their own way and, you know, have, have been on Broadway and are a specific version of the show that people want to see. Yes. So, you know, when you go and see Hamilton, you, you see pretty much the same show that happens on Broadway. Although, although this is a new thing that is happening and Hamilton is a good example, that Lin-Manuel has been very clear... Mm. that in casting Hamilton you want people who are going to bring something of themselves to the role so that you are actually allowed to create your own beats mm. in the musical, which in a lot of other musicals you can't do that. Mm. Um, you know, uh, for example, come, come From Away, you will always see the same show that you've seen yes. anywhere else because it's, it works so perfectly and the producers and the creatives expect it to work that way. In independent theatre, that freedom to, as you say, be prepared to go into rehearsals. But then when you get into rehearsals, Alex Bellage might be like, I don't like that song at all. I want you to do <laughs> something different with that song. Yes. We have to use that song, but it's in the show. Yes. Um, but I don't know what it means. Hmm. So if you remember in Young Frankenstein, there was the song that he ended up having a, a hermit crab yes. singing. Yes. Uh, singing. <laughs> what was the song? Da, da, I'm so uh, lonely. So lo yeah, the lonely song. Ronly. No, that's not Ronly. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's from that's, Team America. That's something altogether <laughs> different. But he hated the song. It's like, what can we do? And we sort of created this version of the song that helped him, oh, now I know what this is. Yes. You know, it's complete madness. You know, it's just going to be, we're going to do everything so quickly and it'll, you know, yes. uh, uh, the audience won't know what's what. Exactly. And it really, it really was pulled off like that because yeah. you all, you plural, uh, didn't approach the show as this has to be the exact same as it was yeah. in its original productions. And, and when you think of how we started to shape Merrily, for example, mm. when we started rehearsing with the band, God, months? Months yes. before we actually went into rehearsal with the cast, mm. like we already had the show down mm. because we knew, okay, this is a show that normally it's, it's another instance where it's 12-piece 13 piece, big brass. Yeah. You know, we knew that, okay, we're only going to have five, five musicians. So, what do we do? How do we make this sound interesting? Um, and straight away, having, having a drummer who has the electronics and the sampling capabilities yes. to let's just grab the typewriter. Exactly. Let's grab the ding of the, the, the return arm or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, let's grab a horn stab. Mm. And let's program those in so that there is some semblance of the big sound, but it's unique. Yes, exactly. How, and, you know, whoever's listening, you might be wondering, well, how the hell does this relate to flow state? Mm. Everything that we've been talking about here relates to flow state is because we have a semblance of an end goal, not a defined um, fixed end goal, but a semblance of an end goal. I, I think we need to define flow state a little bit yeah yeah so how do you define flow state for me flow state is when i'm working on a project uh, whether it's artistic or even just um clerical clerical being sorting out uh, paperwork every, doing your tax <laughs> everything from my tax to organizing my file systems on my computer to uh writing a song that's just for me or collaborating on a song with somebody else um so flow state for me is when I'm doing that thing, I forget what time is. Time sort of evaporates and I uh, am, am deep into the computer or, or my drum kit and then I look out the window and it's dark outside. I completely forget about 
time or if there is a time restraint, you know, the, time, the, the clock just starts ticking faster and faster because I need to get, you know, the creative thing done for the deadline. So would you say then that experiencing flow state is being inside your joy? Yeah, yeah. That thing that you most enjoy doing, like f- f- for me, the best example is if we're jamming. Mm. Let's just put music theatre aside for a second. You're in the middle of a jam and you're playing a groove. Mm. You, know, you know, some of these get-togethers that we've had, you sit down, you lay down a groove. Conrad, the bass player, is like, oh. You know, he yeah. starts playing something and the two of you, the eyes meet and you just lock and you just for that moment in time enjoy that little groove. Then I add a little bit of keyboard. Hmm. And then I just forget myself and I just want to sing about something. It just comes out and you f- you do forget yourself and you flow along with the moment. Yes, yeah. You're not thinking about, oh, i got to do my tax. i got to do my tax. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you are not thinking about, oh, I've got to conduct this next figure. I need to bring all these people in. Yeah. You're not thinking about that. You're just inside your joy. Mm. And you do, you forget what time it is. Mm. Um, but that can also happen, I think, in the theatre once you've, for example, built up enough confidence and muscle memory with a show. Let's say we've got through all of the previews, mm. we've got past opening night, which is like, oh, my God, opening night. It's yeah. just like, you know, you love that it's happening but it's nerve-wracking. Yes. You get past that, you get into the show and you just enjoy playing these wonderful songs. Mm. Like with Merrily, how much did we love that show? Yes. How much did we enjoy playing that show eight shows a week? Yes. And how much did we hate it when we were stopped <laughs> and because COVID we had to go home? You know, and also the beauty of that thing is that we didn't have a click. We're not playing along with a click. So in our flow state, let's take this a little quicker. Yeah. Yeah, well, like uh, like in Franklin Shepardick, for yeah. example, uh, if <clears throat> Ainsley wanted to push it or bring it back a little bit, we had that semblance of, and he wouldn't necessarily say that. No, it's all it's all through the uh, not even seeing him; it's just hearing it, hearing yeah. it in in his breath, yeah. hearing it in the in the urgency of the message, hearing it in his breath. But when we're when we're wanting to get to that flow state, I've always found personally. Uh, that if I have an end goal, uh, if I have, okay, I want to write a song and I want it to sort of have a, have a groo- groove with a certain uh, synth and I want it to be um, this sort of structure, like a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, outro structure. Yep. And I say that's, that's sort of the, the parameters I want to work within. Um, even if I change up the structure, I don't even end up using a synth bass. Um, if I don't even uh, use any drums in it, the point is I've sort of given myself an end goal, um, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with say um, working on somebody else's project because when somebody else gives you a project, they're already giving you an end goal to work on. Mm. Um, like for example, when you were given well. Um, uh, American Psycho, they gave you all the tracks, but the end goal changed because you immediately heard that it was dated. You immediately heard that you could update it and you immediately knew that you were able to work with Alex uh, in collaboration because Alex is the type of person who wants to subvert the message and really bring the musical to life. Hmm. I mean, the end goal is still the same. The end goal is you're putting on a show. But if you're writing a song and your end goal is presumably to, okay, I'm going to finish this song by the end of the day or I'm going to finish the shape of this song, the basic shape by the end of this day. Yeah. How does that then pertain to your flow state? For me personally, yeah, yeah, so it's definitely I need to have a certain thing finished by this time. So is it in sort of in the midst of you programming that you just, I'm doing these four bars and I just really love this groove? So it's usually uh, finding a groove, finding a sound like yeah. when you if you find new sounds you become inspired online. yeah yeah and you just want to work with it yeah you know um but i really think personally and as a tool that i've used and that we have discussed before is just having a semblance of an end goal to work towards or uh, even a even an end date 
to work towards saying, I want to have this done by this point in time. A good, a good example could be some of those speed writing sessions that we've done. We haven't yeah. done for, for a while, but we've done a few of those where it's like, let's write three songs yeah. this afternoon. Or, or, or actually not three songs, not a completed songs, but let's give ourselves a time limit to work on this particular groove, mm. you know, and, and do it really quickly. Like I'll sit down and play a, a keyboard riff, yeah, something. And it's like, okay, your turn. Then you get up and we're, we're sort of recording this as we go. We're, we're sequencing. Then you'll get up and you'll put in some drums. Yes. And then I'll get up and put up bass. You know, we might just be working at eight bars at a time. But while we're doing that, we're just losing ourselves in, I'm so inspired by this. this is great. I really love this groove. I mm. want to play this. Because, you know, we don't start recording until, oh, I found something I like. Yes. Let's capitalise on that. Okay, enough. Finished. Yeah. Your turn. <laughs> Do something in drums. Uh-oh, here comes the 7-8. Yeah. Here comes the 15-8. <laughs> oh, can, can we at least have a bar of 4-4, four, four, please? <laughs> yeah, and uh, but with that, it's really important that when we're um, giving ourselves these end goals, we're giving ourselves, just like with uh, yourself and the musicals you've done, you're giving yourself the parameters. You know, um, because without the parameters, uh, we end up getting everything sticks to the wall, the proverbial spaghetti. Uh, everything sticks to the wall and it ends up a mess. Um, so when you've been working on your various projects, how do you actually decide whether when you're going through the flow um, and putting all of these ideas forward, how do you decide or with the people you're working with, how do you actually decide, my God, this question has taken ages to ask. How do you decide it's a good one, though. Come to on. keep Bring it out. the strands of spaghetti? It's nearly there. What spaghetti sticks to the wall? Oh, because you oh, have to choose. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't fall off on its own. Some ideas are really, you know, with any of us. But Look, it comes down to, like, the first thing is, is the collaboration. Like, it's all very well to sit there at home, and I've done it a lot, sit there at home, create something, sequence it all by myself, sing everything. But it's that decision to then collaborate because that collaboration is the thing that then inspires you to even, you know, to do more. So there's that. Mm. There's that, 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 you know, this, this allegory of spaghetti hitting the wall in order of not making a, a, a mess is that, okay, if you start to involve somebody else, then you get somebody else's idea that will, oh, and then there's this and, oh, then there's that. Um, also, I think not thinking about it too much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if you've reached a point of flow state with anything, you're just allowing something to come out. Mm. And you're not too hypercritical about it. You just let it go. And, I mean, that is the nature of flow state, those little inverted comma yeah. fingers, um, you know, that, that don't think about it too much, just let it happen. It's like a wave. It's like, you know, you're surfing and the wave picks you up and whilst you're on the wave, oh, the view is amazing. That's all you're thinking about. Oh, it's finished. Swim out, go again. Yeah. So I think that's how you avoid the mess is that you don't think about it too much. You don't be too hypercritical on yourself mm. because creatives, we, we love to be mm, critical. Yes. Of ourselves and others. It happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. One thing I've found personally that's been uh, helpful, um, uh, I'll say, antidote to the hypercriticality. Uh, that's a oh, word I'm gonna. Oh, hypercriticality. That's a word now. Can you spell that? No, <laughs> I'm not spelling that. <laughs> but uh, an antidote that I really think has helped me is um, just putting the recordings that I've made out, not holding them in the box and by the box I mean... You mean getting them out into the world, yeah. releasing them. Putting them out, releasing them into the world. You know, releasing yeah. music now is so easy, putting art out there. And it's not it's not a money thing. It's not a, hey, look at what I've done thing. It's, it's 90% for me a personal thing to just put it out, Complete finally it. finish it. Like for me, my finishing... Uh, when I say I've finished something is when I've uploaded it to like um, some of like my socials or my website. Yep. Um, I can still edit it. It's on my computer. I can still remix it. Like that's not a, that's really easy to do. But having that 
okay, finished for me is putting it up. I think that's a thing that a lot of creatives have problems with. Um, especially, you know, working in the theatre, you get a lot of people who are, you know, playing all these roles and they can they can sing anybody else's material, give them the sondome, it's great. And then you sit down and you say, wow, have you, have you written it? You've got such a great voice. Oh, yeah, I, I love to write, but, you know, I've just not... I've tried it and I've tried collaborating with, collaborating with a few people, but I've never actually... never followed it through. Mm. If... And that's why I think the speed writing sessions are so great. Mm. Sit down... Sit down, force yourself <laughs> to just finish something in whatever form it is, finish it, move on to something else. Mm. And as you say, by completing something and, and putting it out online and just putting it out there, mm. and, I mean, it's not like you're fishing for comments. Mm. It's not like you're fishing for likes or whatever. Mm. It's for your own benefit. Yeah. And if people like it and some people and a lot of people do, then that's great. But then it's like, okay, what next? Yeah, and I, I, th I th feel like it builds up in layers like we're writing the Bruce Lee musical at the moment yep. um, and that's a completely different way to approach a flow state because um, doing a big project like writing a, a musical theatre show, um, putting on a large production of a show like uh, Joe Acaria with Drummer Queens, um, having those grand ideas uh, such as writing an, an entire book as opposed to a short story. Yeah. You need to, I believe, need to have done the, I would say, the harder yards in doing and finishing the little projects and building up that... Um, building up your skill sets. Building up the skill sets, but I think equally as importantly building up the habit of finishing the project. Uh, like I, I think a great example is the difference between Stephen King and George R. R. Martin. Uh, they had an interview together. I can't... I'll put the interview in the description. Uh, so they had an interview and George Martin, he asks Stephen King, how do you finish so many books? Like I can't even finish mm, my... I can't finish my precipice of a book, which is Game of Thrones. How do you do it? Um, and Stephen King says, I, I make myself write, I think he said it was three pages a day. Right. He writes three pages a day, no matter how good or bad it is, he just writes it. He says, I make sure to try and finish those three pages. Um, but before that, he, was a, he, he wrote for Playboy. He wrote a lot of articles in Playboy. He wrote um, short stories. So he had already built, I'm not quite sure of George Martin's writing history, but I do know of Stephen King's writing history. He had a propensity to do things and finish them and then publish them and if you don't have that um um if you haven't built up that habit if you haven't built up that skill yep. set in saying okay this is 90 percent there but you know what it's got to go out it can be really hard to put something out because then you end up rewriting remixing rewriting remixing and then it never gets released and then 20 years goes by and something that you feel like other people could have enjoyed um, turns into something that puts yourself into a spiral within your own art. Well, that, well, that's why I think coming back to finishing something is a skill. Mm. Oh, it totally is. So, you know, when we're, we're talking about doing these sorts of things, you're doing it because you want to enhance your skill set. You want to learn how to do a, do a thing. Mm. Okay, so at its barest uh, point, writing a song might be sitting down and writing some poetry, writing words. That's that's what I can do with a pen and a pencil or on my phone. I'm just writing some lyrics about something that happened. Yeah. Something that I feel compelled to get out. Yeah. You know, and it might, you know, it it might just end up being a poem. But then poetry has a habit of turning into songs. And it's like, okay, so that's that's the one skill of, okay, I might not be a very good lyricist, but at least I've got that out. Okay, I've got that. Now I'm going to go and use another one of my skills. I can play piano. Mm. And then on top of that, I'm going to sing some of these lyrics. So there's another skill there. So it's layer of layer of layer. And then I'm going to go to my computer now. I'm going to open up Logic or GarageBand and I'm going to, okay, that's the tempo. Okay, here's another skill straight away, learning how to sequence something so that 
as a musician, as an artist, as a songwriter, you can get it out of your body, put it on your computer and start to listen to it back and then, you know, oh, I'm going to put some loops in there or... Mm. Um, so once again, it's it's just compounding all of those skill sets and then I'm going to finish this. Mm. It's just a simple song. I've got piano, bass, drums that I've recorded and I'm going to sing it. Mm. And I think a really important thing with that is um, like with my student, um, hello, student, <laughs> I know you listen to this, uh, uh, if you don't have the skill set um, and you want to do it, not thinking that the barrier necessarily is not being able to do a course in it or um, have a necessarily have a one-on-one mentor with it. It's great when you do and have somebody who's invested in your learning. But uh, for me, learning how to... Um, uh, sequence things. How did you look? Audio engineering. I just got a. I had a copy of Cubase that I got with one of my hardware things, and I just started recording with it. But I, how did you know to do that? You just open like if you've never used that before. So luckily for me, I was. I did some classes in high school, but for Photoshop and um, for iMovie. So I took those skills and transferred them over to audio engineering, which, um, you know, it's, they're wildly different. <laughs> but, well, in some, in some respects, edit, editing video and editing music is very similar. Yeah, you're editing to those beats. And Technically. It was, I mean, just in terms yeah. of layers on the screen. Yeah, exactly. And it was just jumping into the deep end of, okay, I'm going to write a song on Cubase. I use Studio One now. But it was, you know, I'm just going to write a song on Cubase. I'm going to record people on it. Um, and through wanting to do that, oh, how do I add reverb to this? YouTube. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, YouTube or I'll try and find it myself. And if it takes more than 10 seconds to intuitively find something on uh, the audio software I'm using, the um, music notation software, the Photoshop, any of that, if it takes more than 10 seconds, I just Google how do, what's the hotkey for this. Or how do I do this? And I find somebody who's greatly better than me at doing the thing and then I watch their five-minute tutorial and then I immediately implement it. I don't look up all of the hotkeys immediately because that's too much information. I don't need to learn all of those hotkeys. Yeah, it's step-by-step, step, isn't it? Yeah. The But, yeah, the biggest thing I found is just doing a project on the software you're learning or I want to record a song. What is recording a song involved? Um, I don't know. Let's just – I'll YouTube it. How do I record my first song? Heaps tutorials. And I mean, once you start to get into that and you start to realise that you can, in fact, do that, mm. it inspires you to do more. That self-perpetuates. Exactly. Um, and with that, you're not only a musician, you are also an artist in the whole fact of you do video editing, you do photo editing, um, you paint as well. Uh, you've painted many, many things. Um, you are an avid botanist. Um, cause God, you love... God, I don't know about a botanist. <laughs> Although I do know the name of a lot of things, but yeah. Yeah, well, you know how to look after your plants within your garden. Um, so how do you incorporate those different elements into your musicality and vice versa? The way that they all sort of work together, especially for me at home, I might get in, well, let's just say I've got a job. I need to sequence this song and I need to do it today. I need to finish it today. I might sit down for an hour and I'll start the sketch out and I'll start to do it. But then at a point I take a break and it's like I've got to stop and I need to go and do something different. I'll go out into the garden. Hmm. And it's just that thing of once you start working on something, you re- of course your mind is turning, okay, I need to do this and I need to do this and there's like a list of things that you need to do. Mm. Um, and at some point it's like you've got to get away from that so that you can get a bit of clarity. Like I might work on a – dance music is, is notorious because you've got, you know, um, 135 BPMs with a oonce, 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 oonce going yes. over and over and over again and quite – often you're just working on eight bars at a time so you're hearing the same stretch there's a point where you need to stop and go away yeah and i'll either go out to the garden Mm. 
and all I'm doing is focusing on the garden or focusing on, you know, oh, I've got dirt under my nails, you know. <laughs> yeah. Or I've got a painting up mm. and I'll just walk away from the computer, walk away from the piano and just do some painting. So it's all in an effort to just allow my mind to keep clearing itself out again. Yes. So that then when I come back to the thing I've been working on, I've got a bit bit of a different perspective. Oh, I, you know, I can play that from the beginning and I've, that's missing. That's why I didn't feel good about that. Yeah. So that's how I sort of incorporate all those different skills. And, of course, there's the more practical, um, you know, I might be doing a track for somebody and then they want to do a video clip. So that in itself is exciting. I'm like, okay, great, what can I do? Hmm. Um, let's do something quite unique with this. Let's take the camera out and go and, you know, film the dogs at the beach or whatever and then come back and we'll edit it up. When growing up, I remember people always saying to me, and I think we've spoken about this, you and I, as well as other people on the podcast, of about, um, you know, you should you should get a trade or you should find something else to do. Um, and they say that with a monetary sense. And I, I strongly disagree with that because I am a firm believer of if well, when you get really good at something, um, yeah, I might not be able to, uh, my chances of owning my own home are greatly diminished being a musician, but I will live my entire life doing exactly what I like. But I have now come to firmly believe doing something else and having a skill set in something else, not for the monetary reason, but to have something else to go to when, when I so for example, I do it actually with, it, not necessarily with music, but with um, things that surround music. This podcast is one of them. Yeah. This doesn't necessarily have to do with me playing an instrument, but communicating with other people. This is my getting away from music. Uh, video editing. I love video editing. I love Photoshop. These are the things I go to because music, fortunately, is a main job for me now. Um, I get to do that or I, I learn the trumpet or the, the saxophone. So it's these things that I go away to just to enjoy for the sake of enjoying it as opposed to opening up a, a theatre book, which I love doing, but there's still that semblance of I have to learn this entire book and it has to sound really good by opening night. Yep. Like it, it just has to. It, there's no option for it. Whereas if I'm playing the saxophone, if I sound like a bit trash it's okay you know there's nobody there to be like but you're lucky because you're you're what they would call a polymath you know oh. someone who does a lot of other a lot of a lot of things I, I think that's probably me as well yes that we are lucky in that we do have varied and wide interests especially in the field of the arts mm. in music like you, you know, you're not satisfied with one instrument. You have to do everything, and now, you know, now you're learning to sing and do all that sort of stuff. I think a lot of people have problems with that, and you know, I, I like to think that everybody could have the propensity to have lots of different instrument uh, interests, but for whatever reason, oh, I, I, I can't paint. I can't do that. Mm. There's some little mechanism. What's the? It's that like that inner game of music. Uh, uh, talks about, you know, is it voice one and voice two? Yes. Is it? Is it voice one? And that, that voice one, in a lot of respects, prevents you from doing things because the whole time it's it's critical. It might be, oh, that's the voice of my mother that's continually in my head. You need to sit down and practice that. You need to keep mm. on practicing that. And my mother would quite often say, Andrew, you try to do too many things. Mm. You need to focus on one thing and get good at it. And whilst I think that is very true and I did focus on one thing and I got good at it and it's like, what, what can I do now? Yeah. I want to do something else and I want to get good at that as well. Yeah. And then once again that, that self-perpetuates flow state. I mean I've only been musical directing professionally for the last 10 years. Hmm. Before that, I mean, you know, I've worked a lot in community theatre so I, I, I cut my teeth on learning how to deal with you know, casts and teaching people things uh, mm. from a very early age. But um, recognising when there's an opportunity to jump in and do something that you might not have done before. Mm. Um, like I was pretty bold back in 2012 um, and I hadn't done any professional musical theatre 
I had conducted a few bands and things, you know, but the largest orchestra band that I had uh, conducted, I think, was like 12 pieces for a mm. community theatre production. Um, uh, someone that I knew had been conducting the orchestra for Florence and the Machine uh, in London and uh, she was an arranger that I knew and she wrote to me and she said, do you know anybody who could conduct a concert for Florence and the Machine? You know, it's a it's an 80-piece orchestra and it's a 20-piece choir um, but it can't really be a classical person. They need to have a pop sensibility because, you know, it's Florence and the Machine and there's the, you know, the piano player and the... And, the, and um, I wrote back and I said, I think I could do that. It's like I'm <laughs> fully expecting her to say, oh, no, I need someone who's had a bit of experience. But she's like, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> so suddenly, you know, I've got a three-hour call with this 80-piece orchestra and, uh, and it was actually really easy. You know, it was really easy because I just I just jumped in and I thought, I can do this, I can do this. I only have to wait, I only have to keep in time. I know <laughs> the song's inside out, I just have to keep time. And then, we, you know, we had a three-hour call at the Opera House with Florence yep. and suddenly there was a 30-piece choir, which I hadn't seen before. I'm like, okay, the concert's <laughs> in a couple of hours. Um, I need to bring the choir in as well. No problems, all good. <laughs> it's knowing when those opportunities mm. are there and I think a lot of people get it in their minds that they're looking for a particular type of opening or they've got it in their mind, oh, it needs to be this. And so they don't recognise when there's a completely opposite opportunity available mm. that they could have taken advantage of. Mm. So you've got to be so open-minded about... And open-minded about your own skill set. Like uh, I, I think that's such a great example of you have a skill set but you haven't been able to apply it in that certain bigger way. Like yep. you haven't uh, conducted an orchestra until you've conducted an orchestra. Yep. You know. Um, uh, for yep. me last year it was uh, doing a piano vocal score for Dubbo Championship Wrestling yep. for uh, Daniel Cullen who was the first episode number one. And I... You know, I've done a lot of sheet music before, know my way around Sibelius, know my way around harmony. But a piano vocal score is a completely different beast. And and I was thinking, oh, can I do this? Am I, can I do this? I've never done a piano vocal score before. But then also my mind is like, well, that thing, I haven't done a piano vocal score until I've done a piano vocal yeah. score. So this is the perfect opportunity. I'm in safe hands. I have plenty of people now to ask uh, about how to go by it and get, um, um, uh, you know, just to check it out, see if I'm on the right track. But now I have finished it and I can now take those skills. I had the opportunity to do another piano vocal score for Queen Lear for uh, Laura Murphy. Yep. And it was, I, in my opinion, it was much better. It was a lot easier to do. I knew a lot more of what yeah. I wanted to do and how I wanted to approach it personally, um, as well as more of the standards that are uh, immediately looked at within a piano vocal score. So just like with your example, you know how to more approach a large orchestra now. Yep. You know, you know how to approach... Uh, small ensembles, large ensembles, and then orchestras. But you don't get to do that unless you say yes to those things. But also making sure that, you know, you're not completely in the deep end and you're going to drown straight away and, um, you know, have to do the walk of shame. But, I mean, that's the thing as well is, like, you, you, you jump into this opportunity and you become useful in your, in your own mind. Um, but it, it, is, it is that thing of... You know, you've, you've got to be easy to get along with so that people will then, you know what, he'd never done this before but, my God, he did it um, and he was calm about it. He was clear. I understood what he meant even though, you know, like the, the classic example was um, the, the lead violin player, the concert master, she was, uh, you know, first violin in the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and I do remember after having this quick three-hour call and suddenly we've got a full house at the, at the uh, concert hall in the opera house, standing in the wings with the crowd going off out there. And I went up to the, the concert master and I said, look, thanks for all your help in this yeah. because I've never actually done this before. And she was like, yeah, I've done this all the time. And she's like, just stick with me. It'll be fine. Yeah. You know, so you just never know until you know. You started out with your first musical being... Um, 
Oh, I forgot the name of it. Please, sir, can I have some more? The first one. Oliver. What? Oliver. Oliver. That was oh my the first God, one you directed. Memory. There we go. So Oliver. I played was... Timpani. Oh, you played Timpani. I was like 12. Oh. oh, that was the first one you played in. Yeah. So you've been playing in musicals ever since you were very young. You were involved in musicals ever since you were about three, helping your mum out. If it's, your mum was yeah, there. it's all my mum's fault. Um, how have you used the skills from that point in time to shape how you actually approach um, what you do in theatre to sort of, as we've spoken about, set those end goals, know what is expected because even though your first professional job was a decade ago, uh, you know, you still had, you still knew the expectations required within musical theatre. What were some of the crucial ones that you definitely knew of when you stepped into that position? I I, I think the thing with with mum, my my mother was the, the costume mistress was her, Costume mistress was her title and she used to design and organise all of the costumes for all the various shows for the Orange Theatre Company. Um, and she used to drag me along a lot of the time um, and I just, I just loved it. So I got to see all of the different angles of mm. the theatre and the first time, as, as you say, with Oliver, I, I was 12 years old and I played some timpani and I think I played a little bit of piano. And then the next show I did, I was pulling ropes mm. backstage so I got to see how that worked. And, you know, then I was pushing pushing things on and off stage and it was actually some time before I actually... And then I played piano for a couple of things but it was some time before I actually did my first musical direction job uh, with the Orange Theatre Company. So I got to see the theatre from all of these different perspectives. So by the time I get to where I am now, I have an appreciation for stage management. Hmm. That you know, when the show is on, the stage manager is the boss. Yeah. You know, you have an appreciation for all of those other people that are working their butts off, and that you are just a cog in the machine. Mm. Um, and you know, there's no sense in being a, a, a diva or oh my god, you know, I, I'm not getting enough sound here. I'm not, you know, me, 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 me. Mm. It's all about all of those different jobs that are being done. All of those people that are all working together to, cre- to create the same outcome. For me, the biggest leap into musical theatre, which was only properly two years ago with Mamma Mia at Laycock Street Theatre, um, was learning all of the jargon associated. Uh, and I've quickly realised uh, whenever I'm heading into a musical situation is learning that jargon as quickly as possible. Like, I didn't know what sits probe meant. Like, what the hell's a sits probe? Now I know that's when um, the band and the cast first play through together properly. Like, it can happen beforehand, but that's when it's meant to... As opposed to a vondel probe, which is when it happens in the theatre with the band in the pit. Yes. Uh, and it's it's about learning uh, those other subtle expectations. Um, well, subtle being... Um, you you know you're always showing up for the hour call knowing exactly when you're meant to show up um knowing exactly what's expected of you throughout the week um knowing what's expected of you in terms of if you can't do a a show because when you're doing eight shows a week for you know uh, a month or two months or six months or three years uh, you are going to have to have somebody dep in at some point you know especially if you're doing those really long shows So it's knowing those expectations and having those discussions with the musical director, (laughs) with the musical director and and everybody being comfortable with it, Um, knowing how to navigate, um, knowing how to navigate with between the band and the cast and and the boundaries that need to be there or aren't there, you know. Um, how have you sort of navigated that yourself? Well, once again, I think it's the, it's just that thing of just having your ears open the whole time mm. and listening before you speak. Because at any point, okay, you might be at the top of your craft or you might have a certain skill set and know what you're doing. Mm. But even so, you, you just got, you've got to listen out. You've got to be open to what's going on around you all the time. Yeah. Um, I think it's just listening before you speak is the, is the first thing. Mm. And, uh. And as I said before, it's like being easy to get along with. Yes. You know, um, being a team player so that 
that director will say, I really enjoyed working with that person. I'm going to, I want them again, mm. you know, or, or any number of people. Like, and I mean, that's the, been the beauty of the Hayes Theatre is that I tend to work with a lot of the same people again. Um, and that's exactly what's happened in the last two years with, you know, yourself and uh, the other musicians mm. that, that we've been using in the, in the last few shows uh, from Rent at the Opera House to Young Frankenstein uh, to Merrily We Roll Along. Um, and there are other projects that we are now doing together because we know we all work well together. Yeah. And, and fine, I've worked with a lot of people over the years, but it's that expectation of, okay, I've got this job, like we're, we're about to do this uh, um, tour with Boy George in, in March, Fantabulosa, mm. and we, we kind of don't know what the job is yet. Yeah. We know that, okay, <laughs> there's going to be a list of songs that uh, all these fabulous artists are going to sing and they're going to be reinvented. So straight away I need to put together a team of people that I know and trust, mm. uh, like yourself. I might say, look, I need all these electronic drum sounds. Can you find these sounds? Yeah, great. You know, we, I know that you know how to do that mm. and that when we bring it to the rehearsal, you know, uh, I say to Cluffy, oh, look, we're going to need a banjo for this song. Total trust yeah. in my work peers so that no matter what happens, and that's sort of maybe leading back to the room full of spaghetti again, yes. that it's not getting out of control is... is Using uh, people that I'm familiar with, that I've worked with before, mm. and I know we will gel straight away into whatever the job is. You know, we've t spoken about several topics in this podcast. It's gone from flow state to musical direction to collaboration. Um, let's do a fire round. Uh, let's go several for each of things you would recommend for Let's start with flow state. So what are several things that you would recommend for somebody diving into flow state or wanting to explore flow state more within their craft? Well, I have to start from what I know and that's as a piano player that I started as a piano player. So that's the first step is get good at the piano. Just get good at it. Um, then you sit at the piano, it's quite natural to then want to sing. Okay, sing, get good at singing. Listen to a lot of music, sing along. Um, you know, and unashamedly, I grew up with ABBA playing on <laughs> my, my... My mother had these speakers built into the roof so I could go into the piano room and fire the ABBA and I would not only play along but then I would start to sing the harmonies, get mm. good at harmony. Mm. Um, and from that I can then, OK, I want to put a vocal group together. I want to use those skills that I've got. So it's a thing of keep on compounding all the various skills in that field. Yep. So before you know it, I'm not just a piano player, I'm playing piano, I'm singing, I'm, I'm learning harmony, then I'm able to put together a vocal group, I can put together a band. Yeah. So straight away there's a heap of skills there that I've just accomplished. Uh, what we were talking about before is end, those end goals, yep. having those end goals so we know where to end up and you know, just exploring the sounds, exploring the things you are good at. Well, and those, those and it's interesting, you, you, you keep talking about end goals, but they're not necessarily the end. Exactly. They're yeah. necessarily that, for example, we, in, in the musical that we're writing about Bruce Lee, which is, you know, it's a big task. Yeah. The very first thing that we, we did, we sat down with a cork board and we plotted out with cards... The journey. Yeah. So there's there's one end goal or there's yep. one goal. Okay, this is kind of a bit, a bit of a map. And then in each one of those cards it's like, okay, this is the song about when he first moved to America. He had no money um, but he started to use his skill, the, the only skill he had at that point, which was teaching Kung Fu. Yeah. So he started that because that's where his flow state was. He knew how to do that. He knew how to teach. He was personable with other people. People loved him. Um, so straight away we think, okay, we need to know everything about this point in time with Bruce Lee. Yeah. So our, our goal is research. So we sit down and before we've written a word, written any music, we spend hours going through the books, talking, mm. talking, talking, talking it through. And I love that we, you know, we'll have our Google Docs open so we've both got the same active document open and we're just writing as we go, you know, and adding to it. So it's all research. So that's one goal. And then a couple of days later we take that, all of that information, 
and turn it into lyrics. Hmm. So there's another goal that we... And then eventually we take what we've written to the piano or to the sequencer and then start creating music. Yeah. So there's little spot goals. So end goal is... is I mean, the end goal... Is to have it finished, <laughs> have a musical. <laughs> well, no, even beyond that. I mean, you finish it and then you want to get it on. Yes. But then after that, you want it to transfer. Yes. And then beyond that, you want it to go off and have its own life. Yeah. And then we begin another project and we have another set of goals. Exactly. And then we're better at it the second time around. Kind yeah. of. <laughs> Hopefully. Well, you know, one <laughs> well, would presume. it would be. Yeah. Uh, unless the, you know, other musical completely falls over. But Don't if say it, it falls, if something it falls won't, over. It won't fall over. But if something does fall over, uh, you, if you pay attention, like you said, if you keep your ears out and listen and you're looking, you will know why it fell over. Yeah. Um, uh, number two, fire round. Uh, being a musical director, people who are becoming a musical director, aspire to become a musical director, what would you, several things you would recommend to uh, either focus on or pay attention to? Well, the same thing again, coming back to, I have to keep on coming back to the, the first stage for me is as a musical director, I need to know how to play piano. I need to be able to read music relatively well. Mm. Um, and singing, as I said, I think that's another thing because then as you're teaching people, you want to be able to play the notes but sing it to them. Hmm. Um, so developing all of the skills as a, as a musical director before you launch into that, um, yeah, it's about making sure you, 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 you're across your instrument, um, you know how to read music and you need to be personal with because, and, and confident in playing somebody a melody. Yeah. And just being calm about it. It's like some people, like especially with the, the Sondheim, people are, oh, can you, I don't quite, I can't hear that that interval there. How is that going? Mm. Being able to repetitor and being very patient. Mm. As a musical director, you've got to be so patient. You need to make sure that you stop, mm. that people have understood the passage you've just played. Sing that back to me. Do it again. No, that, you're not quite getting up to that note there. Listen to it again. Mm. Not being condescending at all, and I was like, "Oh, you still don't have this. Why doesn't this person? That's that's yeah. not that's counterproductive." Yeah. <clears throat> so I cannot stress enough how you need to be calm and personable, so that um, people will trust you. Yes, yes, um, and, and I think one other thing from what I've observed as well is is knowing your your band, yes, and what they can bring to the table. Uh, and also what they can't bring to the table. So you're not necessarily going to put somebody in a position where they definitely can't do something, not because they won't eventually be able to, but because, um, you know, they just won't be able to do that in the next few weeks or few days. Well, I mean, that's, uh, I've been very lucky in that respect because a lot of the musicians that I, like right back with Sweet Charity, I'd been gigging with these people. Mm. So I'd been playing with them. So I knew their capabilities. Yeah. Uh, you know, I knew that Tina Harris could play, that she could read music and that she was a really quick study. I knew that Joe Akari was a percussionist so he could also bring in all this percussion flavour into his drum kit. Mm. Um, so I've never been in the position where... I've had to work with people that I don't know. Yep. So, I mean, I think that is definitely a thing that when you go into some of these shows, as a, as a new green musical director, um, especially in a lot of community theatre, you don't necessarily get to choose the musicians. You mm. know, the company may say, this is the drummer we use. This is the guitar player we use. Yep. You know, and this is, you know, you've got this gig because this musical director who has been doing all of these shows has suddenly gone on to bigger and better things. Mm. But you are required to use these musicians. So straight away you need to learn what their capabilities are and what they can and cannot do. Yes. So as you say, you've got to know the band. But that the situation that we are in with these shows is quite unique. Yes, it, yeah, most definitely. It's quite unique. Yeah, because when you work... Uh, together with people regularly, you you know the ins and outs of that person. You know exactly what they can bring, yep. um, and exactly what they're willing to do. To if they need to do something else that's slightly out of their um, repertoire, skill repertoire, uh, you can you know if they're going to be willing to 
go the that little extra mile to oh yeah that's all right yeah, and I a, and I know that you're not going to chuck a wally when I say look you know you're speeding up or you're slowing down yeah. or you <laughs> yeah. know actually that groove is really shit can yeah. you you know like, okay well let's try something else yes exactly uh, that, that, that trust is, that trust with it so, those. Uh, things that can seem like personable attacks aren't actually, and it's just you know oh that's not what um, what is required or like that's not the vibe right now. Can we just change it? Yeah. You know, last fire round, we will go with uh, collaboration. Yep. Uh, what are some of the things you have learned that you have found that have really helped col- for yourself for musical directors, for yourself as a musical director to collaborate with directors? Yep. And for yourself as a musical director, for musicians yep. to collaborate with you and yep. you to collaborate with musicians. So we'll start off with you to a director. Well, it comes down to, to the preparation. And in that preparation, before you, months before you, you go into rehearsals, you've got the gig, you know who the director is, you sit down with the director and I just listen. Mm-hmm. I listen to his or her view and their, and their vision for this show, that's number one, just listening to what they want. And then straight away I start to feed back ideas, start, you know, it's a bit of a, an image board. Um, oh, I, I think it could sound a bit like this. And this is also the beauty of working at shows at the Hayes in that we don't have to create carbon copies that, you know, we are able to reinvent mm. the show. So straight away I can start throwing ideas at the director and he can go, Yes, no. So straight away I know, ah, I know where your head is at with this. I know I can I can work with you because I now understand what your vision is. Yeah. And as I said before with some directors, they don't know what that vision is until they get into the room. So still it's just, it's like listening. What do you want from this moment? You know, what is the intent? Mm. Um, the whole time... Unless it's my own production, which I haven't done for quite some time, um, it's not my vision. It becomes my vision, but it doesn't start with my vision. Mm. So that's with the with the director. That's that's how it it has to work. Um, with other musicians, um, as you said before, it's knowing what somebody is capable of, knowing what they've got in their litany in their in their gig bag, <laughs> knowing what they've got in the cupboard. What have you got? You've got. You know, you've got all these things. You've got a tambourine up there. You've got, you know, oh, you've got your clarinet down there. Oh, you've got your <laughs> trumpet. So, um, Cyprus, in Merrily We Roll Along in Opening Doors, there's this section where a trumpet plays. Yes. And I know you play the trumpet. We don't have a trumpet player. You know, it's Abby's not going to play. Abby's <laughs> a woodwind player. She has every woodwind known to man, a woman <laughs> and child, but she can't play trumpet it's down to you. How can we make this work? So Cypress says, okay, well, firstly we'll give Abby a snare hmm. because I'm, I'm going to have to take my hands off the sticks. I can keep playing the kick hmm. but I will play trumpet for that. Da, 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 da. So it's knowing that, oh, you will jump at that opportunity. Hmm. Knowing that, you know, with Cluffy it's like, I, need a ma- I think it's a mandolin here. Oh, okay, I've got... You know, I can I can do this, or I can feed it through my box and make it sound like a mandolin. Yeah, um, it's giving you guys an opportunity to shine in a slightly different way, slightly unexpected, and to increase your skill set. It's like, okay, well, so I can now play drums and trumpet at the same time. Yes, who to thunk it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's that. It's allowing you guys to have creative hold over you know your your instruments and your stuff and what you do and and it and i got to say on the the receiving end of that it really makes us feel for me i will speak just for me personally um but it really and what i've seen has made us feel um like the musical is also part of our collaboration it's also our yep. musical as well not in a in a type of ownership way but in a type of we get to be um, part of it, we get to have our heart and soul in it, as yes. opposed to just necessarily reading all of the dots. And yeah. okay, I'm just uh, instead of just being the tool, I'm just the the drum tool. 
I personally felt like, oh wow, this musical is this is my drumming. This is my these are my. This parts. is your version of the show. Yeah, you know, um, and again, not in an ownership way of like, oh, I want rights to this or I want royalties. None, of, none of that. But in a terms of, you know, I got to be creative and I got to put a little piece of myself into this show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, that then has ramifications the next time around. Exactly. It's like you're going to get the gig again because of that. Yeah. Yeah. And because you were so open to actually doing it. Exactly. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew Warboys, for coming on here. Thank um, you, Mr. Cypress Bartlett. You know, I'm always learning off of you, but got to learn a little bit more today and hopefully everybody else uh, who's listening got to learn a little bit more. Um, you have your own website, uh, andrewwarboys.com. Uh, that will be in the description. Thank you so much for being on this. Thank you. Um, so anyway, thank you everybody for listening. Um, enjoy when you're listening to this. I'm going to have some uh, other interesting people. I'm going to have a, another keyboard player actually on uh, in February, um, as well as other people within the musical theatre industry. This is turning into a bit of a musical theatre podcast. Uh, but I, I promise everybody who's listening that there will be other music elements in here as well. Anyway, thank you for listening. Enjoy this whenever you're listening to it. <laughs>